and welcome to another interview in the Gala Champion uh, series. And today's champion is Sandeep Nulkar. Uh, welcome, Sandeep. Um, and you are the founder and CEO of uh, one of India's oldest uh, translation and localization company, Bits. So let's call you Mr. Bits, as someone has <laughs> done in the past. Yeah. Um, let's start by uh, telling how you started out in uh, localization. Okay. Uh, I think uh, it's something uh, that was a very logical uh, next step to what had happened and what I was doing. So uh, two or three things kind of came together and that's how I got into this uh, profession really. So back in the day in India, there were only a limited number of two-wheelers and three-wheelers. Uh, as mm -hmm. uh, growing up, we had uh, a Bajaj two-wheeler uh, and practically it never worked properly back then. So you invariably had to repair it yourself. So you kind of knew the mechanics inside out. Mm -hmm. So that was just one event, seemed totally disconnected at that point. Uh, eventually, I went on to learn French, graduated in French, did my post-graduation in, in international business. And as luck would have it, I got my internship in Bajaj Auto. And on the first day, uh, the moment they came to know that I can speak, read, write and use uh, French to a decent level, uh, they actually started using me more for their customers based in Africa because they mm -hmm. had a lot of faxes. Uh, back then, you used to have fax machines and they had a lot of faxes that were not translated. They wanted someone to translate it and then respond to those fax messages. So that's how uh, mm -hmm. I really got uh, started. And then once I stopped uh, working with them, like once my internship was over, uh, they still continued to use my services. And then one thing led to the other. I also happened to be um, born and brought up in a place which is like one of the most uh, industrial towns of uh, the country. So Pune is home to probably uh, the world's leading automobile manufacturers, right mm -hmm. from Bajaj Auto to Piaggio, Tata, uh, Daimler Chrysler, you name it, mm -hmm. everyone has a very strong... Uh, thereby uh, auto ancillary industry, a very strong uh, engineering industry, uh, good presence of pharma companies, medical mm -hmm. uh, device companies. And eventually it also became the third largest, fourth largest hub for IT companies. So mm -hmm. this is honestly where all the action was happening. I was there right at the right time at the right place, as they say. Uh, so that's how bits really started. So I uh, founded bits in the year 1992 so that's 30 years now yeah interesting and um you're a long time member of gala um yes. remember why did you join in the first place uh so the one of the first things uh we joined as a company uh, and that was much before we were even aware of uh, gala which was the atc and mm -hmm. I have no clue why uh, that happened because uh, back in the day, we didn't even have internet. So I'm talking about the year 2000. Uh, internet became commonplace in India much after that. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we came to know about the ATC and I think there was just this need to get out of the pond, so to say. Because in your pond, you look like the biggest fish. And mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of pretty sure that Things can't be as good as they look. Uh, we can't be as good as we think we are. And I'm sure there's more to learn. And stepping out, going out of your pond, pushing mm -hmm. your limits, probably one of the best ways we thought we could, you know, grow, uh, learn about best practices, learn about things people are doing differently, or probably even be a little reassured that what you're doing is not that wrong. Right. Yeah. So that's how we became members. So uh, since the year 2000, we've been members of the ATC. Gala happened about 2010, if I'm not wrong, or 2007, 8, uh, about that time. And obviously, the reasons were still very similar. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a large, uh, uh, there are a large number of uh, thought leaders, market leaders uh, out there across the globe. 
and it's not sufficient to you know just uh, have a presence with something like an ATC. You want to expand your borders. You want to know what other people are thinking. So it becomes mm -hmm. a way to learn for me more than anything. Uh, sometimes you know uh, what people are saying, but you still need someone to come and shake you up or just slap you in the face verbally. <laughs> For you to realize, oh my God, I knew this, but I haven't been doing this. So it's it's a very stimulating, a very intellectually stimulating yeah. uh, place for me. Uh, any kind of a conference, any kind of webinars. So that's yeah. uh, one of the primary reasons we joined Gala. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, okay. Gala is very good when it comes to events, as in there are just too many of them. As in oh. sometimes people complain uh, they aren't enough. Gala has a reverse problem. It has a problem of plenty. So okay, uh, well, so the problem of abundance is a good problem. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, let's um, talk about the industry a little bit. We asked in the form a couple of uh, questions, and you give some very interesting uh, answers. So. Um, uh, one of the, uh, the questions was, um, if you had a magic wand and you could reimagine a new business model for the localization industry, um, what would it look like? So I think uh, currently, if you just look at translation as a service or localization as a service, it's uh, fairly commoditized. And mm -hmm. how do you decommoditize a commoditized business? Or how do you yeah. decommoditize something uh, that people now will refuse to look at as a value added service. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the easiest way to do that is go one layer up and which is where I feel that every translation and localization company should aspire to be a content company. Uh, and that's where I think uh, it will change the game for a lot of companies. I'm not saying mm -hmm. all the companies because I'm pretty sure a lot of companies are already doing that. But it's very common to still find people from the industry refer to themselves as a translation company. And I think that's no longer adequate. Uh, it used to be adequate once upon a time. Now, uh, every company needs content and mm -hmm. content cannot be uh, only in one language, uh, be it India, be it anywhere else. Uh, content needs to be multilingual. Uh, so selling something that is lower down the value chain uh, mm -hmm. will only reinforce stereotypes and make this more commoditized. So I think with that ma magic wand, I would really love to uh, see every translation company calling themselves and also being capable of calling themselves a mm -hmm. content. And of course, that means a lot of learning, a lot of uh, right. internal changes as well, because content uh, is not always written content. It can be voice, it can be video, and you need to really up your game, so to say. It's a big change, especially for the boutique translation agencies or the boutique companies uh, okay. to make a step like that, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, another question that we ask is uh, about the current price per word model. Mm -hmm. It seems to, it, it's becoming updated. Um, so what are your suggestions for a new pricing model? I think, uh, and I've always believed uh, that to be one of uh, the ways to solve uh, this problem. And by this problem, I go back to uh, translation services being a commodity for people, mm -hmm. uh, which is where, of course, you want to show value. The moment you are able to show value, people might be willing to pay a higher rate. But if you're still stuck in the per word or per hour uh, logic, I still think you're going to be shortchanged as a service provider. What really turns the tables, according to me, would be going on a project basis. And right. a project has a lot more variables uh, as compared to a mere translation of a certain document. So that's where you as a service provider are also forced to look at the entire value proposition as mm -hmm. to where is this content coming from, where is this content going, uh, does it need to be in a different format? Is there anything else we can and need to do uh, to really offer a project cost? And I think project costing will always look very trivial uh, to clients. It mm -hmm. will always be very difficult to commoditize 
a project uh, it's just like you for example you take any other professional you know you take for example a chartered accountant a lawyer uh, mm -hmm. no lawyer will be paid per hour yeah. uh, as of course lawyers are paid per hour i'm pretty sure they paid salaries too but uh, the lawyers you want uh, uh, for yourself are probably lawyers that you know uh, can charge anywhere between a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars sure. even just a uh, appearance in the court and mm -hmm. that really is not proportionate to uh, any uh, market price so to say it mm -hmm. just reflects the kind of value they can bring to the table so i think uh, a project pricing puts the pressure on the service provider to show that value mm -hmm. and yeah. it actually compels the buyer to not commoditize uh, the service that they are buying yeah very good point and and, and still talking about mm, value and um how localization is perceived i mean it's sometimes mm -hmm. it's considered maybe a necessary evil <laughs> <laughs> something that you need to do because you want you need to expand your activities abroad but and sometimes it's difficult uh, mm -hmm. to persuade an organization that localization is really important and should be part of all the um, of all the operations. Basically, um, how do you convince an organization about the value of uh, localization? I think uh, the answer I can give is only within the context of India because markets are very dynamic, very different. Mm -hmm. I don't claim to understand every market. I have a decent understanding of the Indian market. Uh, in As far as the Indian market is concerned, what we lack today is data. Data is the most compelling way to make mm -hmm. anyone realize that this is not a choice. It's not a if question, it's a when question. Uh, it's a affordability question, uh, which is not something that's happening today. Uh, mm -hmm. Across boardrooms in India, uh, localization, no matter how much efforts the government has taken, how much push has come from so many other sectors, uh, it's, as you rightly said, is something that people will look at as a necessary evil. They don't look at it as a go-to policy. Mm -hmm. Things are changing, surely changing in India, driven by the government, driven by organizations like FIKI, uh, who are championing the cause on behalf of the government. And I'm fortunate to be involved uh, with both these initiatives. So I actually have a uh, very, very ringside view, if you will, uh, of what's uh, happening right now and the kind of efforts that are being taken. Mm -hmm. So surely things are changing. Uh, but the fact remains that deep discounting still works in India as compared to localization. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether I can read. There was a report uh, which said something like, if I can't read, I won't buy. Uh, India defies that rule. Uh, mm -hmm. India says, if you give me a discount, I will buy. I don't care if I don't understand the, and that's mm -hmm. how, you know, Amazon is Amazon. Everyone is whatever they are in India. Right. Uh, some of them have localized, but it's a fractional part of their offering. And there are just far too many languages for you to say that we are localized for India. So right. one can never really be localized for India anytime soon, because yeah. you probably are talking at least a hundred languages and dialects before you can claim that. And that to not only uh, text, but also voice because there's a large segment in India uh, that probably doesn't even read uh, their mm -hmm. own language. So it has yeah. to be uh, audio too. So I think uh, that that for me is the key. Mm -hmm. Data uh, is the first critical point where uh, you actually have uh, associations and organizations, research organizations come in and say that this is how these companies benefited. Now, mm -hmm. as much as I would like to do it, this is a million dollar exercise for example uh, if you really have to come up with credible dependable data you go to uh, those many number of people you have that kind of a sample size and then you come up with data that's very credible that compels boardrooms to take these decisions until then deep discounting will work yeah. but data for me is number one of course policy is another mm -hmm. thing uh, so policy at the government level is already happening there's a lot of push and it's only a matter of time before things percolate down into the industry. Right. Um, and, and you mentioned it, you know, the 
gigantic number of uh, languages in, in India, uh, and some of them are low resource languages, um, yes. is technology like machine translation or speech to speech technology helping in any way? Or are, you know, these languages are so morphologically rich, some of them, or many of them, and then there's a the problem of the script and the low data. Um, can technology help? Is technology evolving uh, quickly enough for the Indian market? So surprisingly, uh, in that aspect, India is doing incredibly well, as in uh, it is an IT powerhouse, so to say. Mm -hmm. and the government has really had a very, very deep impact on how India has gone digital. And definitely technology is making a big impact on the language industry. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, the government, as well as uh, India's premier uh, association, which is FIKI, uh, mm -hmm. work relentlessly uh, to ensure that, you know, language technology companies are supported. And uh, there are a mind-boggling number of uh, language technology companies mushrooming in India. Everyone coming up with very unique solutions, very, very specific solutions, uh, because India is a big linguistic problem to solve. And uh, mm -hmm. it's not really sufficient for a few people to come and just solve everything. So you have a variety of problems, a variety of demographics. Uh, it's very complex. It's very complex. The language, the people, the mm -hmm. market, the sensibilities. So I think there is a lot of push uh, from every sector. And that surely is happening. Technology is increasingly visible in the way you are accessing content today. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And and of course, when we talk about technology, we have to mention artificial intelligence, right? <laughs> and there is so much misinformation about what artificial intelligence can do, cannot do. Um, so how can, um, in your opinion, the language industry at large uh, kind of fight this information and the hype about AI? What do you think? I think uh, the most uh, efficient way to go about this would be to first of all eliminate the misinformation because mm -hmm. i have seen far too many companies use words such as ai and nlp very randomly very easily uh, without the fear of being asked to support what they are saying uh, mm -hmm. so it's one thing to have uh, a solution that has ai and nlp in integrated and one thing to claim it so I think uh, even buyers as well as sellers need to be educated on what exactly is AI, what mm -hmm. exactly is NLP, the kind of role it plays uh, in the technology ecosystem, so to say. And that is one of the first things that need to be done. And initial amount of resistance will always be there. It's been there mm -hmm. ever since uh, uh, we moved from handwritten translations to typed translations. There was a resistance. Sure. From type to computer, there was resistance. From computer to CAD tools, there was resistance. There was resistance for machine translations as well. Uh, so there will be resistance for AI and NLP too. But I think it's just a matter of time before uh, the service industry falls in line and adopts better practices because um, mm -hmm. we are in denial. That doesn't mean buyers are in denial. They will continue to work on and invest in uh, such technology. And as that technology becomes commonplace, uh, you have no other choice but to, uh, you know, adopt that and grow mm -hmm. or go out. Yeah, exactly. So, so let's talk briefly about your career. Um, what is the professional accomplishment you're most proud of? It might sound strange, but I'm very proud that I've retired on the 1st of January this Congratulations. year. Congratulations. Uh, I could do it probably because I started thinking about it in the year 2010 and kind of build the second uh, tier of leadership within the company and then just walked away and I uh, I think that's something that I'm really proud of as in people can claim this award made me proud that something made me proud but I know what luck and effort it takes to kind of build that and what strength it takes to walk away from mm -hmm. your own baby so i think i'm really proud of that i'm doing something that i really enjoy which is still connected very deeply connected with languages and um, so yeah that's uh, it's all great uh, i'm still in touch uh, with the management of the company i'm still an investor mm -hmm. in the company 
I'm still the chairman of the company, but uh, I don't look into day to day operations. Wow, that's but, interesting. And uh, okay, we'll have to invite you back and hear about the new project then. But in the meantime, um, uh, the best career advice that you either have received or would like to uh, pass on to someone. Uh, the best career advice, and this is something I always say uh, whenever I get the opportunity to say it, is uh, think less and do more. Because mm -hmm. uh, from where I see a lot of people think a lot, thinking kicks in your analytical side. Your analytical side often leads to a paralytic state where you are unable to decide and take mm -hmm. that plunge and be it a business decision or be it the decision to start a business, no matter what it is, uh, it's oftentimes, you know, an instinctive reaction that triggers something and nothing can really be good or bad or right or wrong. It doesn't always have to be black and white. Uh, so doing, I think, is more important. Once you do, mm -hmm. you fail. And the more you fail, the more the chances of you succeeding. So that's something I have followed, uh, very instinctive decisions, very quick decisions. Uh, some have failed, some have worked. It's a mixed bag as always. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sandeep, uh, for this interview. Yeah, it's a pleasure talking to you and thank you so much, Isabella. Thank you.